A space rock the size of the Empire State Building just shattered 150 years of scientific certainty about how life began. In 1871, Charles Darwin wrote a letter to his friend about life beginning in some warm little pond filled with ammonia and phosphoric salts. And for a century and a half, we believed him. We thought life emerged from Earth's own primordial soup. But on September 24th, 2023, when a capsule streaked through Utah's desert sky carrying 121 grams of asteroid dust, which is about the weight of a bar of soap, everything changed. What NASA found inside those samples from asteroid Bennu wasn't just surprising. They found 14 of the 20 amino acids that life on Earth uses to make proteins. They found all five nucleobases that store genetic instructions in DNA and RNA, and ammonia levels that were 75 times higher than in other asteroid samples that they found earlier. But that's not all. Here's where it gets a little nuts. The amino acids, they were perfectly balanced. Half were left-handed, half were right-handed, yet all of life on Earth uses only left-handed amino acids. So this discovery doesn't just challenge our understanding of life's origins, it demolishes it. To really understand why this discovery is so earth-shattering, you really need to grasp one of biology's most fundamental mysteries, homocryality. So hold up your hands. They're mirror images of each other, right? You can't superimpose your left hand onto your right hand no matter how you rotate them. Molecules, they work in the same way. In biology, 19 of the 20 natural amino acids are homochiral, being L-chiral, left-handed, while sugars are D-chiral, right-handed. So here's the mind-bending part. Life on Earth is absurdly picky. All life on Earth is based on the left-handed form of amino acids. And I mean, not mostly, not usually, I mean all of it. Every protein in your body, every tree, in every bacterium at the bottom of the ocean, they're all built from left-handed amino acids. The assumption we all made. For decades, scientists had a theory. They believed that meteorites delivered life's building blocks to early Earth. And these space rocks contained a slight excess of left-handed amino acids. This cosmic bias, if you want to call it that, they argued tipped the scale towards left-handed life. Scientists have been studying meteorites for decades, checking space molecule handedness, if you will, to compare with Earth molecule handedness. And they consistently found that meteorites contained more left-handed amino acids. It was elegant. It was logical. And according to Bennu, it was completely wrong. Now, Dr. Danny Glavin, senior scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center admitted, and I quote, I have to admit, I was a little disillusioned or disappointed. I felt like this had invalidated 20 years of research in our lab and my career. But then something he said, something that reveals the true spirit of science. And I also quote, but I mean, here's the thing. This is exactly why we explore. This is why we do these missions, right? If we knew everything in advance, we couldn't, we wouldn't need to do an OSIRIS-REx to bring these samples back. And I gotta be honest, I loved that quote. I loved his ability to be challenged and move on with the new idea. So hats off to him. Now, you might be thinking, and I don't know what you're thinking, but this is what I was thinking. Maybe the samples were contaminated on Earth. And to be honest, that's exactly what scientists were worried about. Identifying them in a pristine sample collected in space supports the idea that objects that formed far from the sun could have been an important source of the raw precursor ingredients for life throughout the solar system. So NASA took extraordinary precautions. The samples were sealed in nitrogen immediately upon landing and they were handled in specialized clean rooms. So the bottom line is we have a higher confidence that the organic materials we're seeing in these samples are extraterrestrial. 
and not contamination. So as far as the scale of discovery, I really have to put this into perspective. In that tiny sample, remember, it was just 121 grams. Scientists found something that should make your jaw drop. First, they found all five nucleobases. Let me explain what that means. So DNA and RNA are like instruction manuals for life. If proteins are the workers that build and run your body, then DNA is the blueprint that tells them what to build. DNA uses a four letter alphabet made from chemicals called nucleobases. You have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Now RNA, which helps read and execute those instructions, swaps thymine for uracil. Think of it like this. If life is a book, nucleobases are the letters, proteins are the sentences, and DNA is the library that stores all the books. Without these five specific nucleobases, you can't write the book of life, period. Bennu contained all five. Every single letter needed to write life's instruction manual. And that's not all. They also found approximately 10,000 different nitrogen-bearing chemical species. And what does that mean? Let me explain. Nitrogen is the N in DNA, RNA, and amino acids. It's in every protein in your body. These weren't just 10,000 random chemicals. These were 10,000 different molecular combinations that contain nitrogen, the element that makes the difference between organic chemistry and biochemistry. It's like finding not just the alphabet, but almost like finding an entire dictionary of possible words that life could use. Then there's ammonia, 230 parts per million. Now that might sound small, but it's about 100 times more than you'd find naturally in Earth's soil. And why does that matter? Ammonia is like a molecular Swiss army knife for making amino acids. When amino meets other simple molecules, under the right conditions, it can form the building blocks of proteins. It's the starting ingredient for the chemistry of life. And finally, they found evidence of ancient salt water. Brines that existed 4.6 billion years ago before Earth even finished forming. And these weren't just any salts. They found sodium carbonates that only form when salty water slowly evaporates over thousands or millions of years. It's like finding a fossilized ocean in a rock from space. But wait, there's a plot twist that changes everything. It's the parent body mystery. Bennu's parent asteroid developed in or accreted ices from a reservoir in the outer solar system where ammonia ice was stable. So this would be beyond Jupiter's current orbit. Now, think about that. This asteroid formed in the frozen depths of space far beyond where we thought the ingredients of life actually could exist. Yet it contains everything needed to kickstart biology. But here's the challenge or the thing about studying space rocks on Earth. It's like trying to solve a murder mystery where every piece of evidence has been handled by thousands of people. Can you imagine that crime scene? So for decades, every meteorite the scientists studied had crashed through the Earth's atmosphere. And it was baked at about a thousand degrees. It slammed into the ground and then sat around exposed to things like rain and bacteria and human hands. Even meteorites found in Antarctica and immediately frozen had been lying on ice for thousands of years. Scientists, they know contamination was an issue, but they thought they could account for it. They developed elaborate protocols, statistical models, correction factors. But what if the contamination wasn't adding something? What if it was fundamentally changing the evidence? I mean, think about it like this. Only the toughest molecules survive the journey through Earth's atmosphere. It's like studying car safety by only looking at the survivors of crashes. You're kind of missing crucial data about what didn't make it. The left-handed amino acid excess scientists kept finding, it turns out that in many meteorites, the right-handed versions are slightly more fragile under extreme heat. They break down preferentially during atmospheric entry. Scientists were seeing a survival pattern, not an actual original signature. Dr. Sarah Russell from the Natural History Museum revealed, and I quote, we were surprised to find Bennu has a mixture of left-handed and right-handed amino acids. What that means is that perhaps all meteorites contain some contamination. But it's worse than contamination, it's selective destruction that creates a false pattern. But here's where the detective story for this gets kind of interesting. Scientists had another set of clues that seemed to confirm the left-handed theory, and these came from deep space itself. So in 2016, scientists detected chiral molecules in interstellar space using radio telescopes. They found propylene oxide in a star-forming region, 
and it showed hints of excess handedness. When polarized light from certain stars pass through the cosmic dust clouds, it can preferentially destroy the right-handed molecule. The evidence seemed overwhelming. Space itself appeared to favor left-handed molecules. Every line of evidence pointed the same direction. Now, how could they all be wrong? There was one clue that should have tipped scientists off, but it was honestly hidden in plain sight. And that clue was temperature. The amino acids in meteorites form at different temperatures. Some need absolute zero, the cold deep of space, others form in warm water but they were all found together, which meant that they had to have formed at different times, in different places, and then somehow they got mixed together. Scientists assumed this mixing happened in asteroids, but what if the mixing happened somewhere else? What if it happened here? The Bennu samples showed something remarkable. The amino acids were organized in layers with cold formed molecules physically separated from warm formed ones. They hadn't been mixed. They hadn't been contaminated. They were perfectly preserved in their original arrangement. This three-dimensional evidence was impossible to see in meteorites because the violet landing had scrambled everything together. It's like trying to understand a layer cake after it's been thrown into a blender, honestly. Now, just when scientists thought Bennu had revealed all of its secrets, they found something that nobody expected. Evidence of ancient brine or salt water that existed billions of years ago. A stunning lineup of minerals revealed in the samples, most notably sodium carbonates, which commonly occur on Earth as soda ash, or what you might know as dried up lake beds. These minerals have never been observed in any meteorite or asteroid sample before. But here's where it gets even more wild. The minerals themselves, they tell a story. These minerals strongly imply alkaline pH, substantial concentrations of dissolved inorganic carbon and fluid temperatures below 55 degrees Celsius or for us Americans, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's warm bath water temperature, not the boiling cauldron we imagined. It's more like a gentle, sustained warmth that could have persisted for millions of years. And then they did this thing called the Bennu T experiment. At NASA Goddard, scientists did something beautifully simple. And I quote, we first made what we call a Bennu T. We took samples, we boiled them in water and acids to extract the organic compounds to make this tea. We then analyzed using several different mass spectrometry techniques. And what they found in this cosmic tea was a recipe for life itself, but missing one crucial ingredient, the mysterious force that chose left over right. Remember at the beginning when I talked about ammonia and Darwin mentioned his warm little pond? Bennu contained massive amounts of it. But here's the kicker. It shouldn't exist where Bennu formed. Bennu's high ammonia levels add to evidence that Bennu's parent body originated in the outer solar system where ammonia ice is more stable before it migrated closer to the sun. So this means Bennu is an immigrant, a visitor from the edge of our solar system that somehow ended up in our neighborhood, carrying a time capsule of conditions from 4.6 billion years ago. These implications in my opinion, are staggering. The conditions necessary for the emergence of life were widespread across the early solar system. Increasing the odds life could have been formed on other planets. Think of places like Europa, Encladius, Mars. Suddenly they all become candidates, not because they're like Earth, but because the chemistry for life is apparently everywhere. But if the ingredients for life are so common, if the conditions are so widespread, then we face an even more disturbing question. Why we so far only see life on Earth and not anywhere else? I mean, that is the truly tantalizing question. What if Earth isn't special because of what it had, but because of what happened here that didn't happen anywhere else? So scientists are now racing to solve the chirality mystery. And recent experiments suggest something remarkable. The emergence of homo chirality was due largely to chemistry phenomena called kinetic resolution, in which one chiral form becomes more abundant than another due to faster production and or slower depletion. So in other words, life didn't start with a preference. The preference emerged through competition. It was like a molecular survival of the fittest that happened right here on Earth. So here's the new story of life according to Bennu. 
billions of years ago, in the frozen depths beyond Jupiter, ice and rock accumulated in massive bodies. These cosmic wombs contained ammonia, water, and organic molecules, kept at perfect preservation temperatures. When asteroids like Bennu hit the young Earth, they could have provided a complete package of complex molecules and the ingredients essential to life, such as water, phosphate, and ammonia. But the cosmic delivery was democratic. Equal parts left and right. The choice, the selection that defines all life on Earth happened here. It was Earth's unique conditions, not cosmic bias, that picked sides. So what this means for finding life, this discovery fundamentally changes how we search for life in the universe. We're not looking for Earth 2.0 anymore. We're looking for places where chemistry can make choices. Dr. Timothy McCoy from the Smithsonian put it perfectly, and I quote, just like a batch of cookies, you can have the ingredients, but without time and temperature, you're never going to get a cookie. We don't know how much time and what temperature we need to actually get these elements to react to make something that we would call life. And here is the humbling truth. Bennu teaches us something profound about human nature. We thought we had it figured out. We built entire scientific disciplines around assumptions that a space rock the size of a building just obliterated. But here's the beautiful part. 70% of the Bennu sample will be preserved at Johnson Space Center. It'll be available for scientists worldwide and future generations. We're saving most of it for scientists who haven't been born yet, using techniques we haven't even invented yet, to answer questions we haven't even thought to ask yet. The biggest revelation from Bennu isn't what it contained. It, it's what it challenges us to reconsider. If asteroids delivered life's ingredients everywhere, if the chemistry is universal, if the conditions were common, then life might not be rare because the ingredients are special. Life might be rare because that moment, that precise moment when chemistry becomes biology, requires something that we just don't understand yet. So Darwin was right about one thing. Life probably did start in a warm little pond. He just didn't know the pond was filled with ingredients that traveled billions of miles from the edge of the solar system, carrying equal potential for left and right, waiting for Earth to make a choice that would define every living thing that followed. And somewhere out there on other worlds with their own little warm little ponds, different choices might have been made. Right-handed life, silicon-based chemistry, forms of biology we can't even imagine. So Bennu didn't just bring us samples from space, it brought us humility. And in science, I think that's the most valuable discovery of all. The next time you look up at the night sky, remember, we're not made of star stuff. We're made of asteroid stuff, which came from the stars. Delivered by a cosmic postal service, assembly required. Batteries and apparently chirality sold separately.